Okay, so we're going to get started. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. My name is Lauren Pearl, and I'm Generation Gratify's National Policy Director. I hope that everybody here is doing fantastic and that you are enjoying day three of our fabulous Building a Feminist Framework Summit. Um, first, I would like to start off by, if this is your first panel, introducing you to Generation Gratify. So Generation Gratify is the youth-led movement supporting ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. We are a feminist movement with over 500, I'm sorry, 5,000 members nationwide. And our ultimate goal is to promote gender equality and queer liberation. This fall, I mean, sorry, not this fall, this month, we just published our feminist framework, which is our 183 page feminist manifesto with all of our policy recommendations for the 117th Congress. And this being said, the Building the Feminist Framework Summit is our panel, I mean, sorry, is our summit with the ultimate goal of giving you the skills necessary to be the best gender equality activist you can be to implement the policy recommendations that we put forth because gender equality deserves to be enshrined within our legal system and within our constitution. So this being said, welcome to the Defending Reproductive Rights panel. We currently have an anti-choice and anti-gender equality majority on the Supreme Court of the United States. The current makeup of the Supreme Court has continually rejected efforts to expand reproductive rights and have instead chosen to restrict abortion access. We are here to teach you guys how to protect reproductive rights through legislative advocacy, community care, and by supporting healthcare providers. Um, on a different note, although I know that we are gathering virtually, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land that I am on is currently stolen territory from the Nanticoke people. If you feel comfortable, I would really love for you to pop in the chat the indigenous land that you are from. Um, yeah, so on that note, I would now like to pass it off to our lovely panelists to introduce themselves and share with you their wisdom and passion for reproductive rights. Um, Lauren, if you would like to take it away, that would be fantastic. Hey everyone, my name is Lauren Moxley Beatty. I'm a big Generation Ratify fan after having worked with you all um, on an amicus brief in the ERA litigation. Um, I'm currently a senior counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee for Senator Blumenthal. Um, I am fairly new to that position. I came over from a law firm called Covington, where I did a, a, a range of appellate litigation and privacy and tech work. Um, I have a side project called that's kind of close to the Gen Ratify mission, which is called the Ginsburg Tapes. It's a podcast that takes the oral arguments from Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, advocacy in the Supreme Court and tries to make it um, understandable for folks and um, uh, kind of explore how she was able to find a home for women in the Constitution. Fantastic. Um, Alex, if you would like to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Thanks, Lauren. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Glid, and I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I first want to say thank you so much for having me today. I'm thrilled to be here and super excited. I want to acknowledge that I am sitting on Powhatan land right now, so that's currently Richmond. I did grow up in the Newport News area, but I moved to Richmond in 2011 to attend VCU. Um, I have a background in social work with a minor in psychology, so that's kind of the lens that I look from today. Um, I do wear many hats and I prefer it that way. Um, I'm an artist, a photographer, a teacher to youth and youth artists in my city. I'm a community-based doula and volunteer with the Richmond Doula Project and the Richmond Reproductive Freedom Project. And for the last year, I've had the privilege of serving as NARAL Pro-Choice Virginia's community organizer for the Richmond metro area. Um, I do appreciate y'all for having me today. If it looks like I'm reading a script, I am totally reading off my screen because I wanted to make sure that I hit on every single topic that I wanted to talk about today because I'm super passionate about these issues and think that it is so important. So I'm just thrilled to be here today. Thank you so much, Alex, for your enthusiasm and preparedness. <laughs> um, we really appreciate it and we're so thrilled to have you today. Um, lastly, Betsy, if you would like to introduce yourself, um, we would love to hear more about you and your career. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Betsy Harned. I use she, her pronouns. I am the executive director of Planned Parenthood Advocates for DC, Maryland, and NOVA. And I also serve as the vice president for public affairs at Planned Parenthood in Metropolitan Washington, DC. 
And thank you so much. Um, I just want to echo um, how great um, the Generation Ratify is, how impressed I am with this summit that you all are putting together. And, um, and my fellow panelists, I'm um, just really um, thrilled to be here today um, with you and Lauren with you as moderator. Um, so I've been serving in this role for approximately three years. Before that, I worked at a different Planned Parenthood I'm an affiliate in the Western New York area. If anybody here is from um, Western New York or Buffalo in particular, um, I was with the Planned Parenthood there for a long time. Um, and prior to that, I practiced law for about seven years in private practice. Um, I thought that I'd just uh, touch a little bit about my activity when I was a student. And um, since there are so many um, uh, young people and, and students here today in the audience, um, one of the things that was really important to me in college, if anybody goes to Cornell University, um, I went to Cornell, um, was to be really active in um, feminist causes and gender equality. And then again in law school, um, University of Michigan, go blue, go red, go blue. Um, if anybody's uh, um, coming to us today from Ann Arbor, um, I was uh, involved um, with the, my fellow classmates with law students for reproductive choice. And I just want to say how, again, impressed I am with all of you and your advocacy. It really makes a difference um, for your communities and um, your school communities and your communities at large. Thanks again for having me. Thank you so much. Your kind words really mean the world to us. Um, we tr I guarantee that almost anyone on this panel would love to step foot in your careers and so we just really appreciate you shedding light on the work that you've already done and highlighting the steps to how you got there so thank you so much for that transparency and that guidance um okay so now we're going to be starting off with our panel um just as a clarification anybody who has any questions as the panel is going on please feel free to pop those in the chat um, and we will try to answer those um, either immediately if they are relevant to the question that is currently being asked, or we will save them through for the end and um, answer accordingly. But just please, I'm, if you are half as curious as I am, this panel will <laughs> make questions go off in your head like fireworks. So feel free to put those in the chat. Um, we would love to provide that clarity for you. And yeah, we're going to start our questions. So the first one is for the fantastic Lauren Moxley. So Lauren, I know that you are a strong believer that awareness is the first step for anybody looking to become involved in reproductive justice. As a Senate staffer, can you point us to any specific bills that young people should be aware of in the 117th Congress? Sure, thanks for that question, Lauren. Um, I think I, I, I definitely believe that awareness is an important first step. Um, just to kind of back up before I get into specific bills, um, congress.gov is such a useful resource for you to see anything that's happening in the federal level and um, it ke keeps up to date on like what are the most recent actions with the bill. Um, and it's probably good to have a refresher, although many of you might be closer to this than some adults um, having probably taken government classes and AP Gov and US history, et cetera, um, recently. But um, you know, it's good to have an awareness of the legislative process. Um, I'll do a quick refresher on how a bill becomes a law if that's helpful. Um, and so you know, it always begins with an idea. Um, you, then you have to find a senator or representative to get that, that, that idea out on the floor or out on Congress. Then the bill is assigned to a committee for study. Um, I work on the Judiciary Committee, so we have jurisdiction over various issues that would come under um, our committee. Um, then if it's released by the committee, it can, um, it can go to the floor and then you have to have a vote. And so obviously in the House, you can have a simple majority, which is um, you know fifth, over 50% of members and in the Senate it's more difficult because you have to um, have 60 votes out of 100 to overcome the filibuster in the Senate. Um, and then of course to, for it to become law you have to make sure that you can overcome any presidential veto. So it's a long process for a bill to become a law um, and um, I really recommend if you guys want to learn more about this um, checking out every crsreport.com which has a ton of helpful resources from the congressional research service both on legislative process and on specific um, bills um, in terms of specific bills so my senator is the sponsor of um, one of the major pieces of legislation um, in the women health 
Women's Health Protection Act, um, which would protect abortion access from state level bans and restrictions threatening to eliminate access around the country, regardless of zip code. Um, and so the idea behind this law, and I'm here today just in my personal capacity, so um, this is just my take, um, but the idea here is that while Roe remains the law of the land, many states have been chipping away at its protections. Um, and Alex is nodding because I'm sure she deals with this just day to day as a community organizer. Um, oftentimes these uh, are bur through burdensome requirements on the ability to obtain an abortion that have nothing to do with the health of the individual. And so the idea behind this law um, would be to make sure that um, these restrictions um, could no longer go forward. Um, last Congress, this was sponsored by Senator Blumenthal and there were a total of 44 sponsors in the Senate. So falling short of that 60 number, but certainly a really strong um, place to be. Um, there's, a, there's a companion legislation in the house that was led by Representative Chu. So that's certainly one to track. Um, there's a ton of other bills out there that I'm tracking. Um, two interesting ones that I thought I'd flag for you all are um, both in the more international perspective. So one is the Reproductive Rights Are Human Rights Act, and this is sponsored by Representative Clark. This bill would direct the State Department to include in its annual reports on human rights in countries receiving US development and security assistance, a discussion of the status of reproductive rights in each country. Um, and then the second is um, Abortion is Healthcare Everywhere Act, which is sponsored by Representative Schakowsky. Um, this would be the first bill to repeal the Helms Amendment, which bars US foreign assistance funding for abortion. Um, I could go on, but I'll just say that there's also um, a ton of legislation that's worth tracking in the states. In 2019 alone, there was a record 944 bills aimed at pro protecting reproductive freedom. Um, across 38 states in DC, 147 of those bills were enacted. Um, of course, there's a ton of anti-choice legislation in the states. Um, since 2011, states have passed over 450 restrictions on abortion access. Um, two that I'll, I'll flag for you all that I've been tracking, one is in Utah, one is in, in Ohio, um, and they both relate to fetal tissue and remains. Um, in, the, in Utah and Ohio, these bills require medical providers to bury um, to cre or cremate fetal tissue after an abortion or miscarriage. And reproductive rights advocates argue that these bills make it harder for abortion clinics to, to operate and of course impose emotional and financial stresses on patients. So a ton of activity um, and a ton in the states as well as in the federal government. Um, I didn't know about the state level bills. I'm really happy that you just put those both on my radar. Thank you so much. Um, I have the only state level abortion bill that I've truly been tra tracking was the Roe Act in Massachusetts. So I'm really happy that you just put those two bills on my radar. Thank you so much. Um, a quick follow up question. Um, one of our attendees asked, how will the Senate filibuster affect our prospects of passing reproductive protection? Because of the existing structure, it does take 60 votes to um, pass a law in the Senate. Mo most of the time, there are ways, including bu budget reconciliation, where laws might um, um, be able to be finalized without that, that 60 vote threshold. Um, obviously, that's a challenging number to meet in the reproductive rights space. The Senate, um, thanks to Georgia, is now 50-50. Um, this is great news uh, for a whole set of reasons, um, you know, with the 50-50 and having um, the White House um, as Democrats, um, we do technically have the majority, but it's still far away from the 60 vote threshold that's needed for a lot of major legislation. Okay, thank you so much. So our next question is for Alex. So Alex, NARO aims to educate Virginians and office holders about the broad range of issues accompanying women's reproductive health and rights. Considering reproductive rights is such a polarizing topic, what subtopics or different approaches have you found are best for changing people's minds in the reproductive rights discussion? Thanks so much for asking that question, Lauren, and I'm really happy that you asked it because it's something that comes up a lot, not only when it comes to reproductive rights and specifically abortion, but also when we're talking about issues of racial injustice, gender inequality, and many other issues that we face today. 
So it's something that I myself have also wondered, and I'm grateful to have attended an event that we actually held a couple months ago with NARAL called Politics at the Dinner Table, where we had a really great training on this exact topic with DC Surge, and that's showing up for racial justice. Um, we've talked about a couple of different concepts, including one that's called relational organizing. So relational organizing is really great because it's something that most of us already do in our daily lives. It's the idea that reaching out to someone that you already know is much more effective than a volunteer reaching out to a stranger. It's much more effective than a cold call or just pre-COVID times a knock on your door to talk about an issue. You have much more of a power and influence and say on those that you already know. So research has shown that people are much more likely to complete a task or change their mind about a conversation with someone that they know because we are accountable to people that we know. So even in the age of fabricated and false news stories, you can rest assured that you are a much more trusted messenger to your friends, colleagues, friends, and acquaintances than say, Fox News or some of the other news sources that we know folks are getting their information from. Another technique that we learned about that I found really fascinating is called deep canvassing. So deep canvassing is a technique that was pioneered by the LA LGBT Center. Um, they did extensive testing, which proved that this type of conversation actually is able to change people's minds with lasting results. So the theory of deep canvassing is grounded in a belief that what moves people into action are conversations, stories, and emotional connections that slowly change our perspective. You know, we've got a spectrum where there's the perfect progressive and the perfect conservative, where most of us tend to fall somewhere in the middle or hold a mixture of beliefs. So a lot of us are used to hammering in facts when coming to these conversations that are really emotionally charged. But unfortunately, from experience, we know that facts sometimes just don't always work. So instead of being here to convince people that we are right, um, we're here to have an open, honest conversation with people that helps build our understanding of one another. So it operates under the notion that people change their own minds. People don't care who you think they should be. They care about who they want to be. So just think of yourself, for example. It's likely that you hold a host of different views than you did when you were a child, when you were a teen. I know many of us hold vastly different views or beliefs than we did even a year ago today. So this concept operates under the notion that we are not uniquely special or supremely smart or individually open-minded that other folks are capable of change as well. So I really resonate with this theory because it reinforces that we do share some similarities with those that disagree with us, even if that means that we ourselves were once in a different position where we had different beliefs and have changed our minds based on the information that we have obtained. So when we share our stories and build empathy around real lived experiences, people can tell that we're being authentic. And this technique really involves more listening than speaking. So this is just one conversation tactic. It's not a one size fits all, but it definitely is a tool to put in your tool belt when you wanna have these really emotionally charged conversations with folks that disagree. Um, when we see each other, not as the person who's right and the person who's wrong, but two people who are complicated, we're both learning, we build compassion within ourselves that sustain us through these difficult conversations, and it also shows externally. People are so much more eager to engage in a difficult conversation when they don't sense judgment or condescension. I really appreciate that you highlighted the important role that youth activists can play in initiating those difficult conversations with um, their pro-life family members and friends. I think that that's something that a lot of people kind of skirt away from because they don't want to offend or they just know that it will be a awkward conversation that will at the that they just fundamentally well they think that they fundamentally disagree on. Um, and so I think it's really important that 
we emphasize that those conversations do have value and are useful in changing minds and furthering the reproductive rights debate, not only in your own life, but as you in a nationwide context. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us those specific strategies as well. Um, Betsy, so how do you think students can best support healthcare providers with increasingly rigid abortion restrictions? Sure, thanks Lauren for the question. And um, I think that there are so many ways and we're bounded only by you know, our own creativity. Um, so a lot of what has already been said um, really resonates as somebody who works on behalf of um, a reproductive health care provider um, in terms of having these difficult conversations and being a good messenger and helping to you know, move, move the needle in our, in our communities um, uh, with people with whom we have relationships or we're um, able to build relationships. Um, there are so many different ways um, that students can get involved. Um, for speaking on behalf of Planned Parenthood organizations, for example, there are a lot of different ways that, that people of any age can get involved. Certainly, it's really important in advocacy, whether it's local advocacy or at the federal level, that people just plain show up. And it's been a little bit difficult and different during COVID in terms of um, going out and showing up in person, um, but certainly there has been a lot of um, opportunity to show up, especially outside, and a lot of opportunity to show up digitally. So one thing, no matter what your age, I've got a feeling that a lot of people on uh, this particular um, um, uh, call today, a lot of people, even if they're not old enough to vote, um, you were participating in the process last fall. And so you know that it doesn't matter what your age, you can be a part of letter writing campaigns and sending those postcards to Georgia and doing text out the vote and all of those things and showing up when it's safe to do so right now in our masks, uh, showing up to rallies. And that is something that um, everybody can do. And it's important, I think, um, for folks in the um, immediate DC area, we can do that on behalf of local legislation as well as federal legislation, um, showing up um, at uh, on the steps of the Supreme Court, for example. Um, but we can all do that in our own um, communities at our state legislatures. And um, so rallying, um, doing those calls, doing those texts, anybody can do that. Also, um, there are so many different kinds of programs at the local level. I would encourage folks to check out. So as just a couple of examples of Planned Parenthood affiliates that I've worked with over time, there have been some teen groups um, that are available to anybody in the community. And they um, obviously have a couple of examples. They are things like peer educators where teens can be, and this, this happens beyond teenage years as well, but teens that um, uh, uh, predominantly can be trained to be able to help educate their own um, uh, uh, fellow classmates um, at school and um, out in the community. There are sometimes at some Planned Parenthood affiliates um, and other um, reproductive health care organizations like NARAL and others, sometimes there are theater groups. Um, there are theater groups that focus on writing um, different kinds of content for different kinds of theater performances and going around and giving those theater performances um, to other students in the community. And um, sometimes there are um, uh, other kinds of um, teen specific um, types of um, programs that are advocacy oriented. Um, and uh, so I would encourage everybody to reach out, identify um, uh, through you know, your ordinary uh, channels. You're certainly welcome um, to contact me, um, but through your ordinary channels to find out who is your local um, Planned Parenthood provider, NARAL provider, other organizations, and what kinds of programs might there be right in your backyard. Um, I know we're gonna talk uh, more about legislative advocacy um, in uh, a little bit. So I will um, stop short of some of the other um, ways that you can get involved um, deeply when it comes to actually um, helping to move a bill. Um, but I look forward to speaking to that um, in a couple minutes as well. Um, Betsy, thank you so much for highlighting all the different outlets that teens can use to get involved in the battle for reproductive rights. Um, Something that specifically made my heart happy was when you referenced the ways that art and comedy can be used to further the conversation about reproductive rights. Um, 
I'm a theater kid at my core, but I am somebody who was born and raised on Tina Fey, Rachel Bloom, Ali Wong. And so I truly understand how comedy can be used to make people question their preconceived notions about gender inequality. And that's just something that I found really interesting and I'm passionate about, and I'm grateful that you shed light on that. So thank you so much. Um, so circling back to Lauren, so Lauren, as a former litigator, could you please point us to any specific reproductive rights cases that young people should currently be aware of? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'll say that, you know, now that I'm not litigating, I'm going to give a shout, a special shout out to my friend who is um, watching here in attendance, Melissa Shub, who's really on the front lines as a litigator in this space. Um, from the outside, I've been really paying a lot of attention to the recent June medical decision and how that's playing out in the lower courts. Um, if it's helpful, I'll give a quick overview of that case. Um, so that case involved the challenge to um, what's called an admitting privilege, privileges law. That's a law where um, abortion providers must hold active admitting privileges at a hospital. Um, in this case, that was located no further than 30 miles from the location where the abortion was performed. Um, and like so many state laws restricting abortion access, as I mentioned earlier, um, this law offered no discernible health benefits to individuals seeking abortions. Um, this case came out at the end of last term, and it was a five to four decision with Chief Justice Roberts joining the liberals and um, striking down this restriction. Um, Justice Breyer's opinion for the liberals wrote that abortion is simply too safe of a procedure to require admitting privileges. It doesn't meet the threshold risk typically required. Um, and opposition to abortion played a role in some hospitals' decisions to deny admitting privileges. Some, a really important background feature of this case is that it was nearly identical to a case that was before the Supreme Court just a few years earlier, um, which challenged an almost identical law in the state of Texas instead of Louisiana. And in that case, Chief Justice Roberts dissented. So he sided um, with the pro-life side of that case or um, anti-choice, I should say. Um, and so the idea here was that, you know, this is such a similar case um, uh, that stare decisis should control. Stare decisis is it's legalese and it's, it's Latin for to stand by things decided and basically it's this principle of precedent. So there was this hope that, you know, this case just became before the Supreme Court, you all struck down this restriction, you should do so again because nothing has changed, you should be bound by your own precedent. Um, and so that's what happened, but I think there's kind of different camps or at least initial reactions to the decision. Um, some commentators were, you know, this is a pro-choice ruling and Robert sided with the liberals um, and we've overturned this anti-abortion um, measure and this is a victory for precedent. This is a victory for stare decisis. And I think other commentators um, were saying, you know, this is the bare minimum view of what precedent is. Um, and really um, saw Justice Roberts' opinion as a roadmap to the next abortion challenge. Um, and so watching to see how June Medical is playing out in the lower courts, um, I think there's some, you know, there's people have competing views, but there's definitely evidence that the latter view of June Medical is, is what's holding the day. Um, and so kind of, I know people who work full-time in reproductive rights like Alex and Betsy and my friend Melissa on this call, you know, are very much, um, watching the cases flow through the courts with a lot of attention to see how June Medical is going to continue to affect reproductive rights. I'm happy to like give you guys examples, but I, I think I'll just leave it there because that's a long uh, legal background. Thank you so much. Um, that case was not on my radar and I'm excited to hop off this panel and start Googling. Um, I would also like to add that for those listening, so Lauren Moxley is a superhero within Generation Gratify because this July we had, I mean, June or July, I forget, but we had the fantastic opportunity to publish an amicus brief for a federal court case, um, Virginia versus David Ferriero. For, I never know how to say his name, Fier. F E R R I E R O. Archivist, yeah. Yeah, the National Archivist. And this case would essentially deem that the legislative deadline on the Equal Rights Amendment is unconstitutional. Um, and so the 
Generation Gratify is really excited about this case from a reproductive rights standpoint because the Equal Rights Amendment would further would serve to further solidify um, the standards set by Roe v. Wade and just work to um, make abortion rights more concrete within the US Constitution, just to further solidify them. So that is another federal court case that Generation Gratify um, has its eyes on and is very invested in. So thank you so much. Um, Lauren Moxley was responsible for, like I said, helping us co-author that amicus brief, and she walked us through the entire process with the fantastic Beth Brinkman and Kate Kelly. So we were so grateful for their advice because obviously, although we are interested in the legal system, most of us are high school students. Um, so we were really guided in how to navigate the judicial system, and it's something that was just an invaluable surreal experience to the Generation Gratify policy team. So that's something that we hold near and dear to our heart and we're very invested in that court case. Um, well, you guys were some of the best clients that I had in my four years at the law firm. So thank you <laughs> for being so wonderful throughout. And I, I've said this to them before, but you know, I have these huge corporate clients um, at my old firm and I had a lot of pro bono clients who were really high profile. Never once did I have clients who created a website to describe their amicus brief and what it meant. And that's the power of youth. And that's what makes me so optimistic about the future is that you guys are thinking differently about how to communicate your ideas. And um, I just have mad respect respect for Gen Ratify. So right back at you. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your kind words. Um, next question is for Alex. So Alex, your background at its at its core is being a community organizer, working with abortion funds and as a doula, et cetera. And so what are some ways that youth who often have restricted, restricted, restricted access to transportation and money can help individuals in need of abortions or birth control in their communities? Yeah, for sure. Well, first, simply educating yourself goes a really long way. And the fact that so many of you all are tuned into this webinar right now and many of the other great presentations this weekend, you are already beginning to do the work there. So another really powerful and easy way to stay engaged is through utilizing your social media. Um, I know that there's a couple of people that I really love following. I'm happy to drop them in the chat after this, but Following sex educators like Dr. Tanaya, who's at Dr. Underscore Cuterus on Instagram, as well as Erica Hart, who is a fantastic racial, social, and gender justice advocate who has a fantastic podcast. Um, she's I Heart Erica on social media. Following reproductive rights and reproductive justice orgs, of course, like NARAL, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as orgs like the Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice are some really great ones to start following and get involved with. Um, like we spoke on a little bit earlier, we are in the midst of legislative session here in Virginia, and there are a number of bills that deal with reproductive health care that NARAL is following, um, including a bill that would expand access to 12 months of birth control for Medicaid recipients, as well as a bill that would allow insurance companies who want to provide abortion care to be purchased on the state exchange. And because of the pandemic, the General Assembly is being held virtually this year, which provides a really unique opportunity to participate in the legislative process right from your home. So I know on our website, which is naralva.org, the first thing that pops up is a notification that will link you to our page with more information on these bills and um, ways to get involved. And of course, I cannot begin to shout out enough how important abortion funds are. Here in Virginia, we have an incredible network of folks who provide funding and practical support to anyone who needs an abortion here in our state. Um, and there are several ways to get involved that don't require transportation or money. For example, if you have access to a cell phone and the internet, you can become involved with funds by getting trained to do intake calls. So essentially when folks reach out to funds, um, you're the one who initially assists them with getting the funding that they need. You could also help with coordinating transportation, coordinating ab abortion doula services. Sometimes folks need accommodation if they're traveling from out of their city and even childcare if needed. So in Virginia, some abortion funds include the Richmond Reproductive Freedom Project, which I have the honor of working with, the DC Abortion Fund, the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund, the Stigma Relief Fund, and the New River Abortion Access Fund. 
I also want to note that even if you are outside of the region, you can still utilize or volunteer with funds across the state. So whether you're in Virginia or outside of the state and you want more information on these funds, you can visit the NAF website, and that's the NNAF, National Network of Abortion Funds. Their website is abortionfunds.org. Okay, thank you so much. I really highlight that you're um, including ways for youth to get involved at the community level with local abortion funds because I know that that's, I personally had never even thought about that um, before I met you. I, I've been involved with Planned Parenthood since I was in ninth grade and Generation Ratify for the past almost a year now and Amnesty International for four years, but almost all the work that I've done there has been from the comfort of my home. It's been um, running webinars like this, letter writing campaigns, um, leading phone banks, that sort of thing. But I don't think people understand that they can help on an individual basis and in helping individuals that are actively um, in need of abortions and in need of that um, emotional and healthcare support. So I just really appreciate you highlighting ways that youth activists can plug into that because I think it's a it's just something that's not on a lot of our radars. Um, so I'm just very, very happy that you highlighted that. Um, so Betsy, um, the Roe Act was recently passed by the Massachusetts State's legislature and aims to codify Roe v. Wade into law. Do you see a benefit of students nationwide mobilizing to pass the Roe Act at the state level? And more specifically, what are, I know that a lot of Generation Ratify members are concentrated in somewhat blue areas. Like I know most of us are from the DC metropolitan region. Do you see a benefit to students mobilizing to support reproductive rights? Uh, like for example, the Roe Act, if they already live in a blue state. Sorry, that's a I uh, muted myself, I'm sorry. But I said, I'm sorry, that's a twofold question. <laughs> um, that's okay, they are both very, very good questions. And um, so um, I will, and, and actually there's um, a, a bill that I would love to talk about that addresses both. And um, so uh, it is really important to support state level work and uh, local work um, at certain points, very, very important. Um, uh, with the threats that are posed right now to Roe v. Wade. You know, Lauren was speaking earlier about to do medical services, which was just decided um, over, or about six months ago. Um, and there are a couple dozen cases that are one step away from the Supreme Court that have to do with reproductive health care. And um, the vast majority of them have to do with abortion access. So it's really important that at the state level where there's opportunity, we protect access to abortion as much as we possibly can. In a world that could exist um, post Roe v. Wade, we wanna make sure that the books are very clear about access to abortion in states where that is clearly their value. So one of the things I wanted to mention today was in DC, um, last year, we were privileged uh, Planned Parenthood advocates of DC, Maryland, and Nova to work with the DC City Council on a bill that was called the Strengthening Reproductive Health Protections Amendment Act, which would do something similar to the Massachusetts bill and what's been done in Illinois and some other states to make sure that our laws were clear with respect to um, access to abortion, no matter what happens at the Supreme Court. And student involvement was imperative. Student involvement, and, and DC is a very liberal place. <laughs> so um, we knew that we would have the backing of um, our champions at the DC Council. Now, DC is not a state, which I'm going to get to in a second and address that a little bit. Um, uh, so, DC Council functions sort of as a state legislature. Um, and so, we were working on this bill, the Strengthening Reproductive Protection Amendment Act. And students were really um, helpful and um, in raising their voices in a bunch of ways. One was that we need to show support. We need to show our legislators that we're here. And so you mentioned before showing up at that time, it was possible to show up in person. We got it, um, helped get it passed right under the wire um, before we all went into lockdown. And the uh, students showed up and students showed up in a way that's um, really um, a really, amazing way for students to, to show up in legislative advocacy. Um, many students testified 
we had a number of medical students in particular who testified and showed up at the press events that we had with respect to um, forwarding this bill. And their voices were so strong in terms of the next generation, um, you know, some were constituents of the folks that they were sitting in front of um, as they gave testimony. And it was an amazing way to um, do legislative advocacy through personal testimony um, from their own perspectives. It was an amazing way to support the bill, which ultimately was successful. And you know, with respect to legislative advocacy in blue communities, we talk about this a lot. I have been, since my career started at Planned Parenthood organizations, I've been in communities that are um, largely favorable towards reproductive health care. And we've always heard from our champions that they need to hear from us. And um, for a few reasons, one of which is they hear from the opposition. So even though they were elected, they were put in office and um, we're gonna you know, help um, help them succeed and help hold them accountable uh, but to uh, furthering reproductive health care. They can't, they can't do it alone. Um, they need to hear from us. They can't just be hearing from the opposition, um, even though they've put their, um, their position on the record. Um, also, in addition to needing to hear um, from us, um, it's really important um, in um, um, in every community um, that the rest of the community is reminded that, uh, that everybody is in this together. It's really important. So for example, one of the things, um, again, that students can do are things like letters to the editor um, and um, social media, of course, is um, an incredible way um, so that other people can see, oh, you know, it's, um, this is broad based, this is normal. You know, reproductive health care is health care. Um, so it's really important in, in communities that are more blue to be able to um, make sure that we have those voices um, loud as well. Um, so it, uh, I would encourage you all to um, check out what's going on in your own neck of the woods in terms of whether or not there might be something that is um, pending with respect to an act like the one that you mentioned in Massachusetts um, and get involved. Now, the one thing that I will say about um, DC in particular when we passed that bill, as you may have been hearing about a lot over the past couple of weeks, with DC not being a state, anything that DC council passes, Congress has the opportunity to review and potentially put an obstacle in front of it. So one of the things I think that, um, uh, and we talked about a little bit today, but that folks can get involved in is also thinking about what might there be that's unique to DC um, and other territories, but what might there be um, uh, tangential to reproductive health care that is providing an obstacle um, to access to reproductive health care and get involved with that as well. So I'll stop there, but I'm happy to take more questions. Um, thank you so much for plugging all those different ways that students can get involved in the fight for reproductive rights, regardless of where they live across the United States. Um, something that particularly resonated with me was when you were just emphasizing the role that letters to the editor can play in elevating this battle. Um, as Lauren Moxley just put in the chat, one of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's cases on the Supreme Court started with the letter to the editor. And Generation Ratify is currently trying to make um, letters to the editor more accessible to your to youth reproductive rights activists. Our fantastic PR director, Leah Deron and Cor, led a workshop yesterday on how students can further amplify um, their reproductive rights stories um, in the media. So I really appreciate that you emphasized that. That's something that Generation Ratify is try it's a skill that we're trying to ingrain in our membership base so thank you so much for emphasizing the importance of that um okay so alex i now have another question for you could you please speak to the importance of community organizing for reproductive rights absolutely i would be happy to um so i come to this work through a deeply personal connection um, it's not myself that has had to seek abortion services, but I have loved and cared for people very close to me who have needed abortions and also people who have given birth. So I feel a very personal connection to this work. And we know from history and from our most recent administration that the fundamental access to reproductive health care is not a given and it's not guaranteed. So especially for Black 
indigenous and communities of color, as well as low income communities, we unfortunately cannot and have not been able to rely on our government to provide us with these essential services. And I'm really happy that Lauren spoke on Roe earlier because while Roe is the federal law of the land, there are several states who through legislation have chipped away at abortion access. So at the heart of it all, grassroots organizations and movements have always existed to acknowledge and fill the gap. Abortion funds and other mutual aid initiatives are critical in filling that need. So I really cannot emphasize enough how impactful it is to be able to actively participate and engage in these types of programs that keep our communities safe, that reduce harm, that provide access and that seek equity. And it's truly how I feel to be able to work with the Reproductive Freedom Project and as a community-based doula. Um, like I said, I was drawn to this work because of a personal connection. Um, being able to do something as simple as answer a phone call or be able to give someone a ride to a clinic has literally made it possible for some folks to access abortion. So at the end of the day, it's so important for us as individuals to participate because we keep our communities safe. We take care of our communities. We as individuals have the power and have the tools to make an impact. And even more so when we are connected to a grassroots movement or organization. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you emphasizing the important role that youth activists can play in affecting individual lives on their um, reproductive rights journey. Um, Another, this question is for everybody. So reproductive rights has traditionally meant access to birth control. However, today menstrual equity is becoming an increasingly important pillar in the battle for reproductive rights. And is a fight that Generation Ratify is taking on with both fists. <laughs> um, where do you see gender equity fitting into the grassroots movement for reproductive rights? Um, you know what, I'll just, I'll just pop in here, um, if that's okay, to get us started. I just wanted to um, uh, just acknowledge and, and also acknowledge, I, I see in the chat, the chat's going by very fast, and I'm listening to, you know, fellow speakers, um, but that Generation Ratify supports DC statehood. Woohoo! Um, I also want to congratulate um, you all on bringing this up, um, this concept of menstrual equity. Um, and it's, it's something that um, I just want to make the link to activism um, locally in, at the, in the, um, the DC metro area. We actually, as Planned Parenthood Metropolitan Washington, there are three areas that we focus on. We, um, at Planned Parenthood Metro Washington, we of course provide healthcare services. We have three health centers in the area. We have educators out in the community, and of course we do advocacy. And our educators out in the community are really leading with respect to menstrual equity on the ground. And we were really proud to put in um, testimony in support of a bill pending at DC Council um, in order to um, help provide period products in schools. And this is something that um, our educators work directly with students and you can really tap into, um, again, when you um, continue to explore what's available in your own community. Absolutely. I um, just wanted to echo what Betsy said. Sounds really fantastic. And also shout out that many of the abortion funds in our region also work really hard to provide menstrual products as well as condoms, access to Plan B. So they can be a really great resource to start when looking for these types of materials and supplies. And I'm, I've am i learned recently um, through Lauren and others about Gen Ratify's work um, in Congress with menstrual equity and working with Representative Meng on this issue. And that's incredible youth advocacy and um, I'm just so impressed with what you all are already doing in this space. And frankly, what I've learned from you um, already on menstrual equity. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you not only highlighted ways for 
um, you highlighted the intersection of menstrual equity and its place in the reproductive rights movement, but you also highlighted ways for youth to get involved in expanding menstrual equity efforts. So I really appreciate your thoughtful answers. A question that just came in from the audience is, how do each of you make your work intersectional? What other issues do reproductive rights intersect with that you would encourage young people to work on or you feel need to be focused on more? I'm happy, <laughs> Alex. I'm, you don't. You don't know I'm looking at you. <laughs> I can't tell when you unmute or I unmute. Do you want to? Do you want to take this or? <laughs> sure. I'll just shout really quickly. I mean, very obvious. Me being in my skin as a black queer person, it's incredibly important to me that the work that we do is intersectional. Um, that we focus on talking about gender beyond binaries. That when we think about reproductive justice, acknowledge and understand that. BIPOC and that's Black, Indigenous, people of color, as well as low income communities have always gotten the short end of the stick when it comes here. So it's incredibly important to center marginalized communities when we are talking about any issue if we want to truly be intersectional and progressive and move forward. I think working in the Senate, um, this, this is obviously a huge overlap between the health people in our office and people who focus on the legal issues um, underlying reproductive care. So that's a major focus. I think that when you're working with principals, um, it's really important to drive home, like to contextualize the issue. So I think for a lot of folks, reproductive rights is about women's rights and like that's kind of as far as their thinking goes and I think whenever you you're briefing a principal or briefing someone who you're working for on issues like this to tee up the types of issues that Alex just spoke about but this disproportionately impacts certain communities this disproportionately impacts um, BIPOC as well as um, certain zip codes where it's just so much harder to get access so a lot of times you know people um, in elected officials are um, they're thinking about nationwide problems, they're thinking about problems from their constituents. But a lot of the leaders who are able to make the biggest difference in this space, um, there's more abortion care back home um, than in spaces where um, their representatives might not be fighting quite as hard. So I think that like as a staffer, you want to put those issues um, tee them up and to emphasize them as much as possible um, and make sure that your principal is aware of the full context. Um, and uh, I, I think I'll just I'll just add I don't want to be um, duplicative of, of others um, at Planned Parenthood uh, doing intersectional work is a huge priority of working on um, uh, immigration reform, a democracy initiatives, economic justice, racial justice, is imperative. Our patients are, um, are people 360 degrees, our communities, um, our communities have been you know, disproportionately impacted by the global pandemic recently on top of, um, uh, you know, um, all the other, um, uh, uh, all, all the other challenges, um, uh, including um, uh, the, the, you know, now a long since um, overdue reckoning with respect to racial justice. And um, locally, and, and again, just a draw to how students can get involved. We were really uh, very privileged to support um, the platforms of uh, the Movement for Black Lives um, and uh, really stand with uh, um, the racial justice initiatives that, um, that are um, currently pending in um, local and state legislatures. And just as one example, we put in testimony from our education um, folks again this past year at DC Council um, a testimony to encourage the reallocation away from uh, uh, more police in schools to other kinds of service providers in schools. And we, in order to address, um, uh, uh, in order to address uh, issues from a public health perspective, I think that um, it is imperative uh, that we work intersectional and intersectionally. And as a reproductive health care provider, um, we know that we need to um, broaden not just for reproductive health care in order to really serve our patients. 
Um, I really appreciate that a lot of you just highlighted the intersection of reproductive rights and racial justice. Um, something that I would just like to add to that conversation also is that Black women um, are three times more likely to die during, um, I'm sorry, to experience a maternal death than white women just because of poor um, Black maternal health care and current um, racial disparities and maternal morbidity. And so it's also important to make sure that abortion rights are available to everybody who need them, needs them to, as a way because, I mean, sorry, because we know that some pregnancies can eventually end up more dangerous um, strictly because of racial disparities in our current healthcare system. Um, a question that has appeared in the chat in two variants that I think can be answered rather quickly, it'll probably be our last question of the panel, seeing as we're at 258 now, but how to um, acknowledge differing religious beliefs in the pro-life movement when defending reproductive rights. Um, something that I would like to add just before we, we dive into this question is that yesterday on the queer liberation panel of the summit, the fantastic Kate Kelly made a point of saying that um, from a law perspective that our first amendment right freedom for, of religion also translates to freedom from religion. And so that being said, that's something that I think is very applicable to the discussion of abortion rights on a federal level. I feel like Alex is the expert on this one. I can, I can give my answer, uh, but I feel like I should go second or third. Um, well, I very much like you all am still learning a lot and um, I just always like to bring it back to a lot of the things that I learned when onboarding with NARAL, when getting into these really sticky, emotional, sometimes non-factually based beliefs and conversations is really root in with your values. Um, we talk a lot about values-based messaging, and um, when you're having a conversation or dialogue with someone, you have to be really careful not to play into whatever narrative they're sharing. Um, the anti-choice side has a lot of strong emotional uh, pulls to get people to, to stay on their side, but we have to be just as strong in our values and beliefs in bodily autonomy, in personal freedoms. And just like Lauren said, the point that was made yesterday that we have the freedom to practice or be free from religion. So it's truly critical to know what values you're coming from, you know, because when you're sticking to a value in your messaging, it's, it's, it's hard to just get into the back and forth, into the weeds. If you stick to your values, don't play into the other side's messaging, stick to your values. And you'll find that, I mean, at the bottom of it, at the basis of it, we believe in personal freedom and the other side does as well. Um, so I think a lot can come from understanding and realizing that we do share some values. We just maybe are approaching it in different ways. Um, Alex, thank you for that. That was fantastic. And um, when you mentioned not playing into the narrative, another another aspect of not playing into the narrative, I just want to quickly add, I know we're at time, is that, um, the a narrative that perhaps um, uh, clergy are not with us. Um, and actually clergy um, are very much um, with us in support of reproductive health care too. It is not, you know, religion versus reproductive health care, as, as many of us know. Um, we have a clergy advisory board um, at, at Planned Parenthood, and there's strong, strong support um, from people of faith and from um, different faith communities as well in um, access to reproductive health care. Yeah, that's right. And I'll just make two points. Um, one on, on Betsy's point about clergy support, a historical argument here that I think is really powerful and true is that sometimes it can feel for young people like yourselves and for me, that this dividing line around reproductive rights um, politically has been this way forever um, and it hasn't. So um, in when Roe versus Wade came out in 1973, it was a seven to two decision on a Supreme Court written by a Nixon appointee. Um, there, I love this fact that like in the um, case file, there was a Gallup poll, like a trusted polling um, resource that said that 
the, um, the year before Roe, 68% of Republicans agreed with the decision to have an abortion should be solely made between a woman and her physician, and only 59% of Democrats agreed. So this is not something that has always been set in stone. Um, and I know you all are super focused on ERA issues, and I, the ERA and anti-abortion kind of dovetailed in a re political realignment that has kind of created the world that we all live in today. And so I think it's just helpful when you're having these discussions to have that historical context and say, you know, this dividing line hasn't been this way forever. And then just generally with like all difficult conversations, whether it's about reproductive rights or any issue, I like learned this technique that I just find so helpful that it's like a balance of empathy and assertiveness. Like some of all of us are better um, at, at different aspects of that. But when you are able to show empathy and make people feel really heard, um, and that can involve really active listening, repeating back what they're saying and making them know that you value what they think, and then it's so much, there's so much more fertile ground for you to come in with your assertiveness and your opinion and your facts. Um, so that's just a general approach that I found really helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you just provided the historical precedent with regard to the Nixon poll. Um, that's something that I found really interesting um, and something that's going to be forever imprinted in my memory as a nerdy reproductive rights activist fun fact. So thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are over time, so we have to close out the panel now, but I would just like to say thank you so much for taking the time to participate on this panel. I can say that everybody learned so much and we're just so grateful that you shared your knowledge and support. So thank you so much. Thanks everyone. This is great. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.